seen. Hall in Toppington House, extending to the back of the stage center. Doors practical, backed by view of the distant country. Enter Lloyd and Davies. Stir, a young lady will be back at noon. The wind cuts this spring morning. Quick, a fire. For her indeed. Sir Joshua and my lady will not be home till six. And for Miss Blake, there's your own fire. What serves the housekeeper may do for her to warm by. Fire for her. She goes out, tossing her head disdainfully. Hard-hearted insolent. Enter Juliet. Dear Mr. Juliet, the wine's out. And Miss Blake will need a glass, after her long cold ride. Why, Mistress Lloyd, of your five senses, is there one remains? Shall I, Sir Joshua's butler, make a journey down to the cellar, open as I must an untouched cask, and bear the further labour of drawing and decanting, or for her, for Anne Blake? Is that rational? I'd do it for any creature living. For a beggar, a sweep, a hottentot. Ah, there we differ. But, sir, for Miss Anne Blake, remember this. She is your master's niece. Sir Joshua, I know, has the misfortune to be called her uncle. Lloyd, incensed. Why misfortune? Mistress Lloyd, be rational. You know Sir Joshua's sister, who might have made a creditable match. A match Sir Joshua prayed for sunk herself by marrying some poor devil scribbler clerk tutor or i forget the man what followed they'd not a coin or crust she must have starved but that sir joshua received her here with her pulling baby i took child and mother but not the husband no most properly the door was closed on him what happened next his wife, Sir Joshua's sister, ere a year, frets herself out of life and leaves my master. This squalling wench to... Shame. Poor innocent. Poor vixen. From a babe she couldn't bear Sir Joshua nor my lady. Why, she failed in common gratitude. For what? Harsh words and frowns from him, neglect from her, for taunts, imprisonments, and blows of angry nurses to cure her temper till she half became the sullenness they called her yet a heart opener to kindness beats not po 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 hearts are low things i speak of manners lloyd and hers distress me yes you did good service when while miss blake was at your husband's farm you snared that strolling artist for a lodger and gulled him into love love for anne blake i hope he'll take her and so rid my taste of what offends it my poor lady's nerves of daily shocks my master of disgrace disgrace isn't she flesh and blood like them and though she's poor they're equal equal ay equal i'll hear no more such sentiments strike at the root of order oh you're dangerous a leveller, Lloyd, a leveller. I've no doubt you'd have the cowboy sit at table with us and pledge us his pewter. Nay, no more. He stalks out with great pomp. Why not the equal? Our Sir Joshua's father, though London alderman and baronet, was yet a trader, nor in wealth forgot the means that raised him. There be two extremes of men that one can bear. Those born to station, who take it graciously, and those who earn it. But save me from those middle honourables that have no root in custom, yet despise their honest planter, labour. Had Sir Joshua been used to rank or won it by his wits, he'd not have shown his niece such spite because her mother married humbly. Knock. A knock. Not hers. There's too much flourish. Her knocks sharp and bold, as if the door too were her enemy. All but poor Lloyd. 
Enter Laniston, speaking to servant who retires. So, so, I'm out of luck. Good day, good Lloyd. Good day, sir. And Sir Joshua. Returns tonight at six, sir, with my lady. Laniston, abstractedly. Hmm. Lloyd, aside. Now, I told him they'd be gone a week, and thrice within the week he comes to seek them. I've called, you know, on business. Will you wait? I've not a moment. Goes undecidedly towards the door, then returns. Can I see Miss Blake? She's out, sir, for her ride. Huh. She'll be back, though, in an hour or half an hour, or less. I'll wait. Throws himself into Porter's chair. Lloyd, aside. That's odd. He said just now he'd not a moment. How can she help his business? Laniston, starting as from a reverie. So he's dead. Her father, Miss Blake's father. Sir, tis like. He crossed the seas ere she could lisp his name. All trace of him is lost, and in the wave, the furrow of his ship. <sighs> Poor girl. Ah, sir, her lives had little sunshine, little soil, but she is a hardy nature. True. She has a spirit, sir. I know it. I've heard her talk. Walks apart. Spirit indeed. Her very words are cuffs, and yet I like them. They've a health that suits me. Because well-born and rich, forsooth, my life has been all tame and breezeless. Gliding servants have noises done my bidding. Tradespeople, forgetting man is a perpendicular, have crooked when I approached. Often even a woman, whose outside should be mere to her heart, has feigned the glance, the motion, and the blush have them meant for instincts. Oh, all these have closed me in a dead, sultry noon. But brave Anne Blake blows like a morning gust from our cragged hills. I breast it and a man. Hark, that's her pony. Anne heard without. I say you must, for the beast's sake, not mine. She's hot. Walk around gently. Sarah, do it. Enter Anne in a plain riding dress. She rushes up to Lloyd and flings her arms round her neck. Is it not a shame now, Lloyd, that for my sake dumb things should suffer? The poor Jenny smokes. The groom won't walk around the yard. Of course not. She's mine. With great bitterness. Lloyd, soothingly. Hush! There's a gentleman to hear. What, then? Is my tongue to be jailed because he's ears? Rather because he hears. He'd have it free and speak unchecked. Nay, your tongue forces debts on me, which my body pays. See, sir, courtesies for compliments. Good day. Going. But Lloyd, who goes after her, apart. Stay. He speaks you softly. Softly? So your lady speaks to Sir Joshua, yet I've seen him writhe. Our courteous guests speak softly when they stoop to notice the dependent. Who has ever spoken softly to me but to mock? Save you, you, Lloyd, and him. She doesn't deign a look. Well, has he come? Still apart to Lloyd. Lloyd, archly. Who, sweetheart? Laniston, aside. This is civil on my life. He turns on his heel and walks to center downstage. Who? Is there any name I'd waste the breath it needs to sound but... Thorolds. Edward Thorolds. No, not yet come. Absent again for weeks, and still he hides the cause. Nay, I'll not murmur. I've no more claim to his dear love than has the heather to the sun. Yet how I dash down crag through wood or plain in hope to meet him. I'm in full time. Dependents should be patient. Nay, nay, bet. Anne goes out dejectedly, Lloyd accompanying and caressing her. So she's gone. The porter's chair and I are left for company. 
looking off. Here's one to make a third. Why, if I've eyes, tis Thorold, my hero friend from India, my rare compound of grave and gay, whom I perhaps more love than I have fear him. Enter Thorold. Once more here. What? Lanniston! Away from London, leaving all Mayfair under eclipse? What matters to a world that lives by gaslight? What took you from London after your Indian triumphs, ere a maid had asked your autograph, or a fond mother secured you for a breakfast? Thorold, smiling. Business, business. Ay, true, I recollect. But recollect most to forget my name, my quality, and chief all points between us that affect Sir Joshua. I'm pledged. You but see an artist in quest of beauty. Good. I'm on a quest after the grand. Folks call the rugged grand. I've found the rugged. Snowden. No. The peak of Carter Idris. The Pont Aberglaslin. No, it's a she. A girl. Do you know Anne Blake? Thorold, starting but quickly composing himself. Anne Blake? Sir Joshua's niece? The same. Don't laugh. I'm that girl's slave. I've seen her thrice. Does she encourage you? Carelessly. Not she. She pets my heart with such force from her it comes back again in the rebound. I'll win her. You know not when women have well chased you all your life the zest of giving chase to one yourself. I'll win her. Will you love her? Laying his hand on Lanniston's arm. By my life. I doubt that. Women who are but pursued for the pleasure of the chase are like its victims cast off when captured, and the huntsman lover turns to new game. Lanniston, taking off his hat. I thank your reverence. A wife, my friend, should be a sweet bird won to one's breast by cherishing, not a wild quarry to be hawked down. My five years senior, I bow to your reproof. In truth, dear Thorold, I owe to justice. But don't balk this passion. Miss Blake will. Were it otherwise, you'd tire with your honeymoon no older than a crescent. A challenge. I'll make ready for the lists. Soon shall my constancy unhorse your scorn. While I cry victory, Wales, and sweet St. Anne. He goes out. I could not tell him in this frolic mood her heart had chosen me. Her friend, preceptor, met as she thinks by chance. Ah, now, dear orphan, not for thy father's memory art thou loved, but for thyself. She guesses not my station, nor that I knew her father, but her soul, which chill neglect had frozen, at one touch of kindness from me, thawed, and though the current foams at opposing wrong, its waves are clear and bright with glints of heaven. And now to see her. Turning, he looks accidentally through window at side and pauses. Alas, my eyes that thirst so for that sight a while must wait. Sir Joshua returns, and I'd not meet her in his sight, whose taunts my prudence scarcely brooks. Brave Anne, bear on. The day is near I shall have right to shield thee. Exit. Re-enter Lloyd and Gilliot. Not six yet, by two hours. And here's Sir Joshua and my lady back. Enter Sir Joshua and Lady Toppington, followed by servant and lady's maid. Servant, timidly approaching Sir Joshua. Your coat, Sir Joshua. Back, sir. Know your place. Yes, sir. Why does the fool stand gaping there? Why don't you take my coat? Gilliot to servant, who hesitatingly touches the coat. Not so, you country loon. So, there's your pattern. Takes the coat from Sir Joshua with a low bow and flings it at servant. Wait, sir. The cards. A chair, Lloyd. My poor nerves. The cards, Sir Joshua. Are these all? All, sir. Sir Joshua, glancing over the cards. Dobbs, Evans, Jones, the curate, Andrew Ray, from Budgerow, City. Stretch of insolence because he knew my father. 
roberts owen there's not a name worth reading in the batch flings down the cards contemptuously no callers else why no sir none except the earl of uh, coniston except the earl of coniston dare you drag in an earl's name a real earl's name at the tale of fifty nobodies with an except well well lord coniston called at the lodge gate sir to ask the nearest crossroad to lamberis leave the room sir Gilliot bows and goes out he forgot to say squire laniston who's home from london called sir joshua troubled squire laniston lady toppington throwing back her bonnet with an air of indifference yes she spoke plainly and he called three times three times within a week who spoke with him myself sir and miss blake sir joshua horrified miss blake lady toppington in a corroborating manner miss blake send her here no words lloyd muttering more spite at my poor pet goes out well madam well sir joshua you're calm upon the brink of ruin ruin still calmly madam do you know or not that my estate is mortgaged to laniston for thousands that last year he pressed for its redemption that he called thrice in this week doubtless to urge repayment and that to meet his claim i've not his tithe you would keep hounds give dinners bet with lords zounds mind my nerves nerves ma'am you've nerve enough to warm your feet by a volcano well the money was my own i'd none with you no but you'd family what has it brought me i'm shunned by the whole county dear sir joshua is that my fault you married and gained entrance to the first circles i accomplished that they cut you you accomplished that yourself i'm spited every way here's laniston calls thrice and sees anne blake it's ten to one she sent him back affronted oh she's here anne enters with an air of stolid dejection you sent for me yes well sir that's your welcome after my absence is it a pause lady toppington sarcastically can't you say you're glad to see sir joshua must i say what i know false you're too like your low father to be grateful would my house were quit of you it will be soon yes when yon strolling sketcher makes you his wife why leaves he still unfixed your marriage day he had my full consent to take you hence the dog most like repents his hasty bargain anne shudders and utters an ejaculation of sudden pain nay you use her hardly let her not chafe me then speak anne you've seen young laniston thrice the fault was his what errand had he a fool's he wasted compliments on me what was his business i can't tell i wouldn't hear it why you never turned him out of the room no i got tired and left it sir joshua enraged she turned her back on him he left insulted enraged beyond a doubt and for revenge he'll claim his mortgage promptly to anne tis your work yours who live by my sufferance whose least crust is given earned sir not given it's but the price you pay to taunt the helpless that safe luxury like others must be paid for minx anne with a burst of uncontrollable passion 
be sure you shall not lose there's one shall pay you back each crumb you dropped me or if not i'd put my blood brains bones to hire nay coin you guineas out of my life rather than keep it bound to charity like yours she rushes out i'll tame you who who would have nerves enter Juliet. Uh, sir joshua a letter i may say a dispatch squire laniston's groom brought it post haste out blockhead exit Juliet. as i said here's the warrant of our doom he asks his loans and i'm a beggar you too he laughs sarcastically then opens the letter have i eyes there's no hoax tis his hand jove how i hate her yet she must save me what's your news sir joshua do you go to jail sir joshua jocularly no ma'am tis laniston should be confined for life for what crime madness but it makes well for us he'll not press now to have his loans repaid the fool's in love in love in downright love with whom anne blake end of act one act two scene library in toppington house overlooking the grounds sir joshua discovered on left hand yes yes i thank my stars but that i grudge the vixen so much luck this chance falls bravely laniston in love with her a pedigree old as the hills and as much gold as melted would make a lake between them laniston nephew-in-law to me he can't press hardly upon his uncle he'll extend his mortgage perhaps forgive it i can breathe i'm saved lady toppington who has entered unobserved on the opposite side you're in high spirits have you seen her yet have you told her this good news does she keep her senses at such an offer has she yet dismissed that rambling artist zounds how dare he venture to woo my niece she has not dismissed him she knows not laniston's offer quick then tell her haste would mar all she's a girl's love for thorold he showed her kindness what accomplishments she knows he taught her though she may be brought to banish him gold will not tempt her then what will her proud and jealous heart which to say truth has known so little love she almost doubts its presence when it comes a word a look which happier beings would not mark in her wake quick distrust she's stung by thorold's absence that he too treats her as the poor dependent she half suspects already will you urge her to his rejection yes for love's a dream one touch dispels while wealth and good position last for a life also because you're ruined save we've a hold on laniston sir joshua advancing to her thanks lady toppington withdrawing no transports they try my nerves both sides being duly weighed i'd rather live in ease and bear your presence than starve with you in jail sir joshua angrily how silence or i'll not aid you motions him off sir joshua depreciatingly nay we part good friends best friends sir when we part a pleasant morning she curtsies sir joshua bows and goes out gold is not everything it's pleasant too to respect the man one marries 
Once, indeed, I was love's dupe, like Anne, and half betrothed to a poor advocate. She'll have a lot brighter than mine, rank, wealth, and no Sir Joshua. Exit. Enter Anne, attired in a fashionable morning dress, followed by Lloyd. What means this change? I know it's outside fair, but yet tis false. I feel it. This fair garment, worn at my uncle's cost, hangs on my limbs, heavier than chains. I'll cast it off. Child, child, be not so mad. Look in the glass and see how it becomes you. Beauty. Anne, apart. Where is he should guide me here? Why this protracted absence? The cause still hidden mystery. Thorold, Thorold, have you too learned to stint the dues of love when a dependent claims them? Enter Lady Toppington. Go, Lloyd. Lloyd goes out, Lady Toppington sinking indolently into a chair while Anne paces the room excitedly. You're disturbed? Anne, stopping short. Madam, explain this riddle. Why am I invited to your presence? whence these gifts lavished unasked. If they displease you, choose some other pattern. You've decidedly a graceful figure. Anne, impatiently. Madam. Stay. Sit down. You know I'm nervous. That's a charming foot. Nay, then I'll go. She half rises, but is restrained by a gesture from Lady Toppington. Would you indeed be bounteous? Send back these toys. Her bracelets and give the poor their price lloyd has a nephew a brave fisher lad who wants a boat lady toppington with musing admiration so generous i've oft thought we were mistaken in you not an hour since i said she has a heart a heart sir joshua whose love we might have won perhaps you might your uncle and myself i own disliked you Yet there are times when every woman's breast yearns to its neighbor. Yes, dear Anne, I saw what you had suffered. How? From Thorold's absence. Have I struck too roughly a string that jars? Don't speak. For once, once only. I love him, and could scarce debate his truth with my own heart. How should I then with you? His truth? You run to extremes. He's pledged to wed you, and I don't doubt his honor. Do you mean that only honor binds him? There, you pain me. And that he repents his choice? Alas, some men are so impulsive. One brief moonlike fancy abstracts high tides of passion and sheds light on its full sea. But soon breaks prosy day, romance their moon dies out, and their heart's ocean, last night too deep to sound, creeps back and leaves sand, weeds, and froth behind. Anne to herself. And Rex. Rex. Love should be blind, no doubt, but friendship watchful. In proof of mine, take this. Some weeks ago, I found here the dropped fragment of a letter without direction. Deeming it my own, I read by chance its opening lines. They bore such words of passionate tenderness as women breathe but to those they love. Well, Thorold entered and claimed it eagerly. Well, it proves nothing. That he'd a friend who prized him, nothing more. Aside. And yet tis strange. Nay, we'll not doubt then that Thorold means you fairly. Fairly? Aye, he'll keep his bond, you think. But curse the whim that signed it. Has no coin to pay that store of sumless love he vowed. But, oh, he's honourable and ready with the forfeit. <laughs> I could blush at my own jest. Such love suits, nay, such law suits. 
the bachelor a bankrupt, and the maid his creditor. <laughs> Conscience the officer she fees to arrest her victim, and her heart <laughs> is jail. <laughs> hmm. With constrained laughter. I'd give the world to have your spirits. Ah, Thorold's returned. Have you seen him? No. He's written. Once. When did you say? Last week. He named a day for his return? No. Or explained why he delayed? Anne, curtly. He bade me not inquire. He bade you not inquire? I wronged his trust to say so much. Confiding girl. You were to wed in May. Is that so still? No, not in May. In June? I know not yet. He leaves you ignorant on points like these. Her jealous soul has caught the spark. They'll soon be flame. Aloud. I'm silent. But when next he treats you as your aunt's dependent, tell him she bids him rank you as her friend. Enter Juliet. The Honorable Mr. Laniston of Laniston, through me entreats an audience of my lady. Goes out. Lady Toppington, aside. I've paved his way himself must do the rest she looks earnestly at anne who sits absorbed then goes out anne after a pause when next he treats you as your aunt's dependent those were her careless words is it so of late he has been often absent and he checks my questions of the cause He'll sometimes chide them as if I were but his pupil. I must learn restraint and patience, and he'll give me kindness. Allot me half his thoughts. Then comes a bar. Here your love's free to walk. That chamber's private. A duteous wife's content, no doubt. For me, I'm not that wife. Rising. No. Were his heart world wide, I'd be its sun or nothing. Fill my world or burst from it to ashes. What wild wrong is this to Thorold? He who taught me first man's nobleness, so good, so just. I, there, so just. Does justice bind him to those vows? A moment's pity breathed, and his heart shrinks from? Thorold, without. Anne, Anne. He enters. At last. Thorold. She rushes towards him, then suddenly checks herself. So, you're returned. What, for no warmer welcome? Kissing her. Anne, turning away. Nay, you talk as you had been years away, not three short weeks. Did they seem short? To you. Why, Anne? Anne, carelessly. Because you're often absent. What one often does, tis plain one likes, and what one likes seems short. Excellent logic. Then because you've borne my absence often, it seemed short to you. Twas forced on me. Twas forced on me? Explain it. My absence? Thrice. You've asked me that before. Thrice I replied, I cannot. Then my right, the right of one betrothed to know your thoughts, must crouch to your high will. No, Anne. Your love must trust my will. I grant twixt maid and lover should be no secrets, save what reason claims and conscience warrants. If by these compelled to veil his thoughts... I, then... Then tis her part to credit the compulsion. She will think who led her steps in daylight, smoothed her way when rough or thorny, was her shield in peril, in weariness her staff, and when the night sinks on her path she'll cling to him, and feel no star above her head more clear and steadfast. After a short pause she gives him her hand. I knew you'd give your hand. Anne, aside. He knew I'd give it. He molds me like wax, all calm, no passion. If he loved me, he'd be angry. Withdraws her hand. What? Not pardoned? Pardoned by me, 
an outcast, a stray waif on fortune's tide, without an owner's name, or stamped with one I scorn. Whose? Whose but his who lured my mother from her home, made want that cankered life, her lot, dependent's mine, who forced on me the life he left to insult my father's. Thorold, with sudden energy. Hold! A, a stigma, though deserved when a child brands it, makes the hearer weigh the censure with the sin. But if unjust... No, no, you could not mean it. Say I did. What warrant cites me to your bar? That instinct which makes the honoured memory of the dead a trust with all the living. What has warped your heart so from its course? The word of all men who knew my father. He lacked the strength to scale my mother's height, so drew her to abasement. Did she so deem? True, he was of a band whom fortune frowns on, whom authority oft uses and forgets. But still, their souls are the world's life blood. Who? The men who think, whose weapon is the pen, whose realm is the mind. I mean not laureled bards, but daily workers, who, like the electric force unseen, pervade the sphere they quicken, nameless till they die, and leaving no memorial, but a world made better by their lives. You knew my father? We met abroad. "'Twas in his later years. I heard his story there. Your mother held his love above the world, and, spite of menace, gave him her hand and heart. His thrifty earnings sufficed till fever seized him. Then on both fell that sharp want. His wife mourned for his sake, with which his child upbraids him. Anne, aside. Plain he hates me. Never would love on one brief, bitter mood pronounce so sternly. I've at least this grace, that heartless as I am, I free your sight of what must needs offend it. Rushes out by window in flat. Stay, Anne. G gone. My love for her lost father made me harsh. I should have thought how much that secrecy his dying wish enforced must try a nature ardent and galled by wrong. Today, when much I purposed to reveal, and had at hand the spells to soothe her. Producing a miniature and locket. Here, her mother's face in its fresh youth. I hear the locks that flung new grace on grace they hid. Here, too, the words her father wrote, and which, when worn by time, I then transcribed to save them. Looking at the endorsed paper envelope from which he has taken the locket. Enter Lady Toppington by window in flat. Seeing Thorold, she stops short. He takes the portrait. Angel sweetness, unlike thy child in feature, yet when love has lit her mien, I've seen that very look. Pressing his lips to miniature. I'll bring her back, and those mild eyes she never beheld till now shall win me her forgiveness. Anne! He leaves miniature, locket, and envelope on table, and goes out by window in flat, Lady Toppington standing aside, unperceived. Lady Toppington, advancing. I wonder how angels look. I heard that word. Besides, there's no mistaking kisses. Taking miniature. Ah, the face. Not Anne's. Whose, then? A rival's? That indeed were opportune. Methinks I've seen a face which this recalls. Where? Where? Tis fancy. What's here? A locket and its envelope endorsed by Thorold? So. Reads. Token from one more dear than life. Indeed. Anne re-enters hastily by door. Forgive me, Thorold. I was unjust. I... You, madam? Don't decide you were unjust too soon. Do you know that face? Shows miniature. No. "'Tis a fair one, though.' "'Most fair.' "'With eyes that melt the heart, 
with lips that woo such kisses as Thorold pressed there. Thorold? Ay, but now entering by chance and unobserved, I saw it. Nay, caught his words of passion. He has no sister. None. Who's the portrait, then? Ay, whose? Poor girl, too plain his motive for reserve and absence. Do you now read the mystery of that letter he dropped by chance? Hers was the pen that signed it. Pointing to miniature. Your rivals, your triumphant rivals. I, no, you're his enemy. Lady Toppington, handing her the envelope. Whose is that hand? Thorold's. Reads. Token from one more dear. More dear. She falters. More dear than life. Anne drops paper and stands motionless. The paper wrapped this locket. See, the golden hair within's the same that waves across that pictured brow. Shows both. Room. My brain swims. Lady Toppington replaces locket, paper, and miniature and supports Anne. Thank you. I can walk. It was his hand. She reels towards the door and falls. End of Act Two. Scene. A richly furnished drawing room in the Toppington house. Anne discovered seated on a low stool, her arm supporting her head. He loves another. Loves another. Why, I dwell upon the sounds as repetition could exorcise their sense. My heart rebels against my eyes. Have I not seen the face, the painted face, which glows neath warmer kisses than pressed my living lips? Have I not heard those words? token from one more dear than life tis true dupe true as drowning men recall old dreams of shipwreck and in horror's face gasp this is sleep i cling to hope till billows of proof overwhelm me yes he loves another tis best to meet truth calmly this explains his frequent absence mystery reproofs and for his vows to me I stand a debtor, to jealous pique or pity. Am I then so base as to accept them, so weak, that he feels not richer for my love, should see the loss of his has left me beggared? Springing to her feet. Pride's a good robe. I famish, but I wear no rags. Enter Lady Toppington and Laniston. My will's imperious. So submit at once to be our guest. Linking her arm in Anne's. Join with me, love. He can't refuse two ladies. Laniston, who bows aside. Who's the second? Sure not Miss Blake. She met me at the door and deigned me as much notice as the threshold. Silence consents. You'll stay. And to ensure some life in these dull quarters, and reward your prompt obedience, hear what I propose. We'll act a play. Charming. If we can call a company together. Once we played The Story of a Duchess. Here's the book. I have at hand the dresses, parts, costumes. Amuse each other till I bring them. A part to Anne, who turns away and fixes her eyes intently on a marble group. Anne, be kind to him. He loves you and has made you an honorable tender of his hand. She goes to a cabinet. Laniston, aside. She turns from me. Our hostess, gentle lady, bade me amuse you. She imposed upon you a hard employment. True. I'd choose another. Do so. I'd woo you. Then, sir, you'd succeed in your first task. My amusement. She retires up the stage. Well, jest on. Let me but plead. Follows her. Enter Thorold, the miniature in his hand. I've sought her everywhere. Aside. What? 
her aunt here, and Laddiston. I must choose a fitter time for this dear gift, the all that remains of her loved mother. Lady Toppington, coming to front with robes, a coronet, and manuscripts. She observes Thorold, lays them down, then speaks aside. Thorold here! There's danger that must be met, for, spite of all, I think he has not ceased to love her. Ah, what spell rivets his eye? That portrait, Anne. Anne and Laniston come forward. And kind and sudden interruption. Thorold advances. What? You know him? Laniston, hesitatingly. Y yes he calls himself an artist. Nay, is one. To Thorold. That's a portrait. May I look? Your pencil's latest, doubtless. Thorold, reluctantly. Madam. Why? You seem reluctant, quite perplexed. Ah, talent so modest. I insist. She takes the portrait and, turning to Anne apart, opens the case. The very likeness. Look, a fair face, love. Gives her the portrait, then aside. Saw you his confusion. Anne supports herself by table. They affect to examine portrait. Laniston to Thorold. Deuce take me if I understand your mystery. At least respect it. Not a word, be sure, of aught between us that concerns Sir Joshua. Oh, he's your object. Mine's his niece. Remember, you challenged me to win her. Have you won her? Not yet. She's flint. But I'll strike fire from her. The spark will scorch you. She'll remain a stone. Lady Toppington, returning portrait to Thorold. A face that's full of interest. We both thought so. Apart to Anne. Look how he turns and lays it next his heart. Courage. He'll see you tremble. I don't tremble. Aloud. Come, come, the talk dies out. One's thoughts grow numb. Who'll stir the mirth into a blaze? Will you? Gladly. Bringing Thorold to Lady Toppington. Lady Commander, a recruit for your company, not of dragoons but players. Aye, true. Our dear theatricals. All's ready. Showing separate manuscripts. Here's each one's separate part. Group round and listen, while I explain. Aside. I'll turn this to account. All walk to places. Our heroine's a young girl whose mind and beauty raise her from life's low level to a dukedom. The duke who weds her is, of course, the hero. I'll be the duke. Anne forcing gaiety. Beware, sir, your stage lovers have oft sad endings. Yes. Sometimes they die. It's worth the risk of dying for to woo you. Anne, with laughter. <laughs> ah, that's because you're vain, and don't believe I'd suffer you to die. A sharp retort. Laniston, apart to Thorold. Did you mark that? What think you of her now? Think? Or that she's in good spirits? Nay, she melts. Look on and see me win her. Lady Toppington. Resuming, you're the duke, then, and Anne, your duchess, gives each of them a manuscript character. I'll play my part to the life. Ah, would to have for life. Life's a long time. Let's see you play the lover for half an hour first. Aside, glancing at Thorold. He's calm. My caprices disturb him little. Come, begin, Thorold. Oh, I and Mr. Thorold take small share. The humble lover, he who, as he ought, resigns the maid, withdraws his flickering light when greatness breaks upon her path like day. I'm but his sister who advises him to that just course. Begin, then. First let's try a scattered speech or two to test our powers. Say this where the Duke enters. He leads Anne forward. That's the page. Permit me. Lady Toppington to Thorold. With what spirit they adopt this project. Thorold takes the book. Ready. Reads from the manuscript. Scene. A rustic cottage. Enter the Duke. 
Alone, my Marguerite? You turn surprised there. Right. Reads from manuscript. My lord again beneath this humble roof. Direct your feet to loftier homes for your high state more meet. Tis inner worth gives rank to outward place. The court's a court if filled with human grace. The rudest niche is hallowed if it hold a saint within. And men who delve for gold in the mean earth rise princes. Let me be more rich than they to stoop and rise with thee. Thrice have you urged on me this suit before, and thrice have I refused. I'll urge the more. Be rock, and my strong sea of love divide. It ebbs but to return a mightier tide. Repelled again, more high the billows roll, and sweep at last resistless to their goal. Maiden, I claim this hand. He kneels and kisses her hand. Lady Toppington applauds. Thorold interposing between Lanniston and Anne. Stay, Lanniston. That's not the stage direction. He doesn't kneel and kiss her in the book. Shows the page. I did it upon instinct. Rises. Anne to Lady Toppington. Is he jealous? Jealous? With that cold eye? No, but he's proud. Nor brooks another's homage to his bride. I'll sound him, though. Converse with Lanniston. Anne and Lanniston retire to Thorold. I see this pains you. What? Nay, if your eyes are closed, my lips are. Looking towards Anne and Lanniston. Yes, you're right. I'm pained for Lanniston, who may build delusive hopes on her gay humor. I've no fears for her. You're so confiding. Birth and wealth like Lanniston's are strong temptations. Not to Anne. Anne, who laughingly releases her hand from Lanniston and comes with him to front. <laughs> nay, nay, to your task. A cruel task to feign. Only to feign I love you. You had driven the play duke to despair. Anne, recklessly. He was repulsed three times, you know. Tis you would have lost patience. Crosses the stage excitedly. That's a fair challenge. So I count it. Thorold, apart to Anne. Anne, a word. This frolic mood gives Lanniston warrant for hopes you little dream of. Are you sure that I don't guess them? I should grieve you did. I would not think you jest with him. Jest with him? I jested once. But twas before I knew his high condition. He's the nephew, sir, and the next heir of an earl. The man can give his wife a coronet. Jest with him. Jest. Aside. He thought me heartless. Now he'll find me so. Come, friends, the play. Thorold, apart. Have I heard right? What? And barter her childlike truth and plighted faith for rank? For gold? Twas wanton humor, yet this morning's freezing welcome her aunt's warning. I'll end this doubt. Proceed. Tis Thoreau's turn to play the lover. Aye, the humbler one who yields her to the duke. Not till he knows her heart is with the duke, though. Here's a passage strikes me. I know the words. He lays down the book and advances to Anne, who stands apart. Go. I release you. She could not impart, who giving all beside withholds her heart. Did those eyes smile, I should recall, they smiled on loftier love, and deem my own beguiled. Discord to me, the tones, though soft and clear, that make like music in a rival's ear. I gave thee all my heart, as on a throne thou there hast reigned, if reigning there alone. But she, whom from my breast capricious will or pride contempt, that throne shall never fill. Excellent. You quite make the part your own. He is about to come forward. Lady Toppington restrains him, exhibiting robes and coronet. Thorold, apart to Anne. I felt as twere my own. Anne, I had acted even as that lover. A threat? No, a warning. If that ambition or caprice have swayed your heart to Lanniston, 
Your fate were wretched to call me husband. But if from vanity, with no intent to wed him, you would rouse a true heart's hope and love, his fate were sadder who called you wife. Anne, aside. Oh, prompt excuse to stab the chain that galls him. Hear me. No, I've chosen. Here, sir, our pathways part. You're free forever. Turning to Lady Toppington. What have you there? The Duchess's robe and crown. Thorold, apart. This change should be the work of years, not moments. She false, she heartless. Enter Sir Joshua with a sealed letter. It's absurd. It's too absurd. What now? A messenger who swears that Colonel Thorold's in the house and claims admittance. Well, he brought this letter just reached from India. India? Give it me. Tis not for you nor yours. Though you're called Thorold, I judge you're no relation to the Colonel. No, sir. I am the Colonel. Lanniston. Tis true indeed you speak with Colonel Thorold, the gallant hero of our last campaign. Give me your pardon. Takes and opens letter. Is it possible? I, sir. A man of wealth and family that few can boast. A downright gentleman. I thought he lived by his talents. Thorold, reading apart. The Indian minds. Tis news indeed. Friend, give me joy. Those minds in India, where I'd risks. Which you thought desperate. Prosper past hope. They've hit on a new vein. Brave tidings. Shakes Thorold by the hand. Thorold resuming the letter. Ah, what's here? Wait your return. My return? Then I'll be prompt. I'll save her, snatch her from this corrupting air. Sir Joshua, one title you've allowed? I claim another, your niece's guardian by her father's will. I'll bring full proofs with reasons that till now obliged concealment. Hold the lady henceforth at my disposal goes to door what her guardian Puh. her guardian stay stay follows thorold out lady toppington to lanniston learn if this be true she's much moved go lanniston goes out anne musing so his fate were sad who called me wife he said it thorold Lady Toppington, playfully laying her hand on Anne's shoulder. Mazed. Well, so you should be. A rich, high-born guardian dropped from the clouds. I suppose now you'll wed him. For his wealth, when I dismissed him poor. Dismissed him? Well, then, twould look, I grant, should you relent, as if his fortunes bribed you. I'd let despair gnaw through my heart first. Right. That spirit, girl, I love those flashing eyes. Stand so and humor a fancy that I have. They're but the robes of the play duchess. Disposing them round her. Wait the coronet. Places it on the table at Anne's right. A perfect picture. You were born to rule, to shine amidst the brilliant. Ah, there's one, heir to an earldom he, who sues to give no mock robes to my Anne, who'd bind her brows with their fit emblem rank, who'd not repent his vow to a dependent, ah, whose pride would be to watch her triumphs. Anne, suddenly, midst those triumphs, should I again meet? Thorold? Yes. Anne, as to herself. He'd feel I'd lost him and could live. No sickly flower nipped by his frost, but the plume tree that shoots from the scarred rock and nods at desolation. She pauses with sudden calmness, then drops the robe at her feet. Off, off mock shows. I grasp realities. Heart that has never been loved, whose love was scorned, freeze till that weakness perish, Freeze, but shine. Who thinks when glaciers flash, tis only ice 
that glitters in the beam she stands lost in thought lady toppington who has retired a few steps intently watching her now approaches anne ah your hand we should be friends i'll marry laniston end of act three four scene drawing room as in act three enter thorold and laniston nay friend a truce to jesting you indeed propose to marry her asked like a guardian do you indeed propose to think now thorold you should turn out her guardian yes we marry that is with your consent if she decides so then she yet doubts she bids me wait her answer soon in the library looking at his watch cupid and hymen tis near the hour thorold with indignant surprise you trifle don't object to my poor cupid he's a comelier god than miss blake swears by plutus how you know your ward so little She's a sparkling eye, but shrewder than tis bright. Sir, by her sex, nature has spoiled a lawyer. There be women who shine in drawing rooms. Some captivate on horseback, some are irresistible in kitchens. But her spheres are pleaders' chambers. Some charmers lure by dress, some melt by music, some with the imperious lightnings of their eyes effect a breach in hearts, some all by learning she is none of these her forte is arithmetic you should have heard my wooing an hour back and behold me at your feet i cried you'll give me hope what was her answer straight to the point she asked my yearly income net after all deductions if indeed i were a peer's next heir would live in london Take her to court, mix with the world, and see if she mash its proudest, for all which perhaps she'd give me a wife's duty. As for love, I must omit that trifle. Well, I promised. Her frankness suits me. I prefer a hand labelled for sale to one that coyly slides into your palm and tingles for your purse. Thorold, energetically. It shall not be. It shall, if she consent. My truce engage it. Are you a rival that you would thwart me? No. For me, love's spark glows not within her breast. But, sir, I knew and loved her father. When in India one high in rule aspersed my soldier name, his honest, fearless pen disproved the lie, and won me back that amulet true souls must wear, or perish, honour. We grew friends, heart friends, until he died, most poor, most noble. I'd save his child from sin. Sin? That black sin which vows what the heart shrinks from. You have said she loves you not. You're warm, I find, sir. Time cuts short this conference. He bows coldly and goes out. Nay, I follow then. Anne, Anne whom I so loved, my once betrothed. I bear thy loss, but could I bear thy shame? He follows Laniston out. Enter Sir Joshua, Lady Toppington, and Anne. But hear me, my dear niece. Leave me, Sir Joshua. You may trust me, madam. You'll give full consent to Laniston's suit. I have said it. Quick consent dear anne say quick my maxim is secure the bird while the lime's fresh twas so i won your aunt ha ha you'll heed my maxim if you'll leave me to ponder it and further niece don't tell him you take him for his money men don't like it truth isn't told at all times and in courtship one never tells it yet that very truth i'll tell unless you leave me lady toppington apart to sir joshua you'll spoil all 
I'm not at ease. She'll change her mind and Laniston call in his mortgage. One more word and then I'll go indeed. You're sure you'll not relent and marry Thorold? Thorold, who despised the poor dependent? Listen, by each good men value, by what goal or lord's smile is to your heart, or pride to my own crushed one, or prayers to gasping lips, that poor dependent vows never to wed Thorold now withdraw you may and satisfied that vow would bind her though her life paid it come farewell dear niece you'll be discreet now lady toppington forcing him off come a quick consent you'll give a quick consent you'll heed my maxim while the lime's fresh ha ha goes out in glee with lady toppington anne looking after them were my mind less fixed twould swerve revolted from the path you travel no matter now one impulse like the glare of a volcano inward lights my soul and it shows its own nature fire and stone my tears that burned like lava when they fell like that congeal to rock when hope would aim one pulse of life that i the poor abased deserted outcast by my will and brain rise to far heights of power of woman's power to dazzle and enslave that he may feel i had the strength to rule i might have had the strength to love and bless now to my fate as she advances to door thorold re-enters and confronts her stay anne where would you go to the library upon what errand anne with haughty coldness sir you doubt my right to question i'm your guardian but not my jailer tis my will to pass you block my way and is it i alone that block your way are there no crowding shapes such as the soul sees youth's sweet instincts gazing with sorrow-stricken faces memory conscience to warn you from the gulf anne i've not the brain to solve a riddle nor the time then wait and hear me solve it your way leads to Laniston, and you'll accept his suit? After a pause. You're right. Such is my way and purpose. Shall I pass? Not yet. I must. Save force should bar me. Quit my path. You fear to hear me speak, then? Fear? No, speak. She sits and coldly motions him to proceed. A pause what's your theme guilt you would marry yet deny the love makes wedlock sacred do you boast heaven's right to judge the heart no have i misjudged yours say that and go i'll pay the forfeiture of my own deed do you know that forfeit count it and then see if i shrink count what she forfeits who weds and gives no heart i'll try the words which figure outward loss appraise not ruin in things immortal first she forfeits truth she forfeits womanhood in love its essence cuts off earth's blessed commerce with the skies profanes all sacred forms makes home a sound the temple an exchange the shrine a counter the grave a common sod where never kneels love that points upward anne aside and this the thing he made me the perils on my head half rising and would you brave what freezes me to tell hear my last plea then as you will alas no parent's voice may warn implore i'd speak of yours i'd tell you why you ne'er knew a father speak you know already how toil brought sickness sickness poverty how 
bowed in mind and frame, your father sat by his cold hearth. Yet from one faithful breast drew warmth and hope. Before him knelt his wife, your mother. Well? He loved her, as they only can love who suffer. Loved her soul and form. Her form was as the crystal to the light, her soul the light that filled it. Yet they parted. Those twin lives broke and blent on earth no more. What parted them? Well asked, what could? Not want, they had quaffed it to the dregs, and in its cup pledged love anew. Not exile, where he stood was home to her. Not chains, her faithful tears had rusted them to free him. Not the seas, they had foundered on one plank. Not Iceland's snows, you had tracked her footfall there. All these men brave for gold, while love had mocked them. Tell me then. What severed them? They had a child, an infant. Famine was at their threshold. For their child those true hearts quailed. They sought your uncle's aid. He offered shelter to the wife and babe, denied it to the husband. And my father? Strained your mother to his breast, till soon their eyes lit on the form that clung for life to hers. They saw its wan, pinched cheek, the blight of want creep on their blossom. They could save it. He, with one long kiss, till their souls met again, embraced his wife, unwound his beggared arms, and said, Wife, go. And for her child she went. Anne, aside. I must quit or yield. She rises, floraled, detaining her. You were that child. For you they wrenched the bent of life, slid from the raft that buoyed their fainting limbs, that you might ride the sorrows where they sunk. Cease. Will you pay that mighty debt by sin, a sin that mocks the love they worshipped? See, your mother speaks. She pleads. Look in her face. Snatches the miniature from his breast and places it in her hand. Her face. That portrait. My mother's face. Even so. My mother. Mother. Sinks on her knee, reverently pressing her lips to portrait. Thorold gazes on Anne with deep emotion and exits. End of Act Four.